What's going on YouTube? This is David with the Tell It Like It Is channel. Uh, today I have two special guests with me, uh, my cousin Antoine and Jeremy, and we're going to just briefly discuss the first act, step act, well, I'm sorry, first step act, which is uh, a prison reform bill that's currently on the table in Congress. Um, it hasn't gotten a lot of exposure in the media, so we wanted to, to discuss it, its potential implications, uh, some of the potential barriers or barricades that would uh, prevent it from um, being passed and, and a few other things. So we just had a YouTube video that we started, got cut short. So for those who may have been listening, I saw we had a couple of viewers. Sorry about that. But um, we'll continue on with the conversation. Antoine, you were, before we got cut off, what were you saying? This is Antoine. And I am hearing my echo again. So maybe it's on my end. I don't know. I don't hear it now. So now we're good. Good. I was just saying that, uh, you know, there's going to be some uh, forensics left behind. You know, we can tell who voted for the bill and who didn't vote for the bill. It should make it through the House. The Democrats have the House. If they're about that life, if they're really about the support that they say that they give to the black uh, community, uh, then we should shouldn't have an issue in the House. Um, but of course, a lot of us know that well-intentioned people or even people that may pose as your friend may not have uh, any real benefit or stock in, in making sure that you, you actually get on your feet and you're able to operate as a full citizen, right? So a lot of people will want to keep you in a hamstrung position uh, so they can always seem like they're the person or, or group that's giving you support, if, uh, if I'm making any sense there. Uh, I think that if it doesn't make it through the Senate, well, that's a different story. Then maybe we can really expose some of the people that are on the right that you know may not have our, our interests at heart. But the fact that <clears throat> Trump, who has been framed as this racist president, uh, which I, I've been telling, I've been trying to tell people, don't don't believe what the media is is really feeding you uh, about this guy. You know, he, he may be egotistical. He may care. Uh, about what people think about him. He's very sensitive in that matter, but he also cares about people. So he's not a bad person, I don't think. I wasn't surprised at all that he threw his support behind the bill. Um, so it's, it'll be interesting to see uh, if the bill, it's going to be interesting no matter what, because if the bill passes, I think uh, we're going to see a lot of our, our, we'll see fewer black men uh, being uh, in prison, we'll see fewer people being in prison wrongfully. We'll see fewer people being uh, in prison frivolous, frivolously. And if it doesn't uh, pass, well, with whatever stumbling block it does hit, we're gonna it's gonna expose that person who's trying to make you know uh, impede the progress of the bill. And don't be surprised if some of those people happen to be black people. If it happens to be people in the black caucus, right? We're going to see, I believe it'll probably see some type of, not everybody, it's not going to get 100% approval. Yeah. So I, I think that there were some Democrats who came out in opposition to the bill because, not I think, but they specifically stated that they were in opposition because it wasn't doing enough. Like, for instance, Cory Booker. Um, the bill doesn't really attack or address the issue of uh, petty crimes and the heavy pen penalty that's attached with that. Um, so I think that's where some of the disgruntlement is coming from uh, on the left. Um, but I'm, opt I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that the Democratic Party will get on board with this bill because it is a step in the right direction. And I'm also cautiously optimistic that enough Republicans will follow the, the lead of our president and get behind the bill as well, so it can get through get through the Senate. I think that, in my personal opinion, I think the Senate will be the biggest uh, barricade for getting this bill passed. Uh, Mitch McConnell just came out, I think it was like a couple of days ago, and told the president that this bill is it should not be on the top of the priority list, uh, and that their political capital should be spent on other issues, other things that um, have greater importance. And he essentially told the president that it won't get through the Senate this year, um, and they can talk about it potentially being pushed through the Senate next year. So 
that type of hesitancy and reluctance to get this bill pushed through uh, causes me to believe that there's going to be a certain amount of inertia or resistance from the right. Now, ho hopefully I'm wrong. Um, and hopefully sometime this year or even next year, the bill gets passed and Congress in total recognizes the importance of, of this bill being passed for the American people, specifically for, for black people here in America. Yeah, both of them could play. It's a possibility that either side can play political games. I think for the Democrats, we don't want the president to look good. For the Republicans is, if we give you this now, uh, we can't use it as a bargaining chip later. Because, so it can go either way, right? Uh, they know that in a year that maybe that they don't have control of the presidency, if they don't have control of the Senate, and maybe that's something that they would have rather held so they can uh negotiate it then uh, but this is just thinking you know that's thinking through a political mind like why would mitch, mitch mcconnell say something like that and i'm thinking that's where his, his head is at but then again if his head is there then it's not in the right place right and if the democrats head is in a place where they don't want the president to look good their head isn't in the right place this is just a time to put politics aside and think about your constituents yeah because, you know, without doubt, I think it's going to get through the House. The Senate is where I think the issue may rise because they'll, the, in order for the bill to be passed, 60 senators are going to have to vote for it. And like you said, <laughs> when that time comes, we'll have a record of all those senators who vote against it. And I think that'll be very informative and telling to the American people, uh, specifically brown and black people, because we know that we're most affected uh, by our prison system. So. Um, I'm hoping that, again, both uh, sides of the aisle put aside the political games and that they do what's best for their people, for their constituents. Now, I feel like the Democratic Party, um, I, I mean, obviously the Democratic Party has greater representation from the Black demographic. So there's definitely more pressure on them to get this bill pushed through. I think it would benefit Republicans to get this uh, bill pushed through uh, because it will show black Americans that they understand the plight of our plight and they recognize the issue with our prison system and how it disproportionately affects us. And they agree with coming up with solutions to this problem. So it, it would be, it would actually kind of placate um, black people in a sense, if, if Republicans were to uh, to support this bill, um, so yeah. you all think that the Democrats who have come out and stated that they're not in support of the bill because it doesn't go far enough, do you think that they're on the wrong side of history if they continue to echo that that sentiment? I think they've been on the wrong side of history. These are like the, the gatekeepers of the Negroes. You know, that's the best way I can really put it. You have these, especially the, the black Maxine Waters and Cory Bookers and those type of individuals who really, they I think they fleeced their, their constituents in, in, in so many different ways. Um, but I, I look at a lot of what they preach is perpetual victimhood like they would rather you stay in a victimhood of uh, mind a victim victim victimhood state of mind because it benefits them as being some type of savior and also being the the in between between you know the white liberals and the black constituents the kind of they're like the translators you know the whisperers the negro whispers or whatever else where when i i hear uh, certain, I'll just say Trump. I know people don't like to talk about Trump in a positive light, but the times I've seen him really addressing black people, I, I think it's more empowering to black people. It's what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose by breaking the mold? And when he was speaking to the uh, the YBLA and um, the, that's the Young Black Leadership Association in D.C., it was all positivity telling them what they could be how far they could go, what he saw them as, where, where he saw them. So uh, I think it's been unfair how, these, how he's been framed 
in this racist way or it, for being a racist? So for me, if I can interject, I think that's good rhetoric. You know, if he's saying like, hey, they're not doing it. The Democratic Party is not doing anything to benefit you right now. Look at your current situation. What do you have to lose? If, if you come on board with me, I can make things better or I can help to guide your community in the right direction. I think maybe that is what he meant. Um, and maybe it was taken out of proportion. You know, President Trump isn't uh, the best at articulating his thoughts and ideas. And um, sometimes when he speaks, it can be perceived or taken the wrong way. That's really good rhetoric, but I need to see some action behind that rhetoric. And this, him being in support or endorsing this potential, this bill, is action behind his rhetoric. So if I continue to see that pattern with our president, then that's that's a good sign. And I think that I would have more support for him. But prior to now, he really hasn't done or supported any policies that will directly impact the black community. So for me, it's all fluff and all rhetoric when I hear him you know, say some of the things that he says specifically for us. And that's with most presidents of the United States, to be completely honest. So I'm not, you know, I'm not just, you know, trying to bash Trump. I, I think that throughout our history here in America, um, typically presidents don't directly address the issues of, of black people. I mean, I could, I would say Lyndon B. Johnson is, is the only president that comes to mind, at least the most modern day, uh, modern president that comes to mind that actually signed legislation that had a positive impact for our, for our community. You're talking about a guy said, I have these uh, niggas voting for me for the next 200 years or have them voting for the Democratic uh, Party for the next 200 years. I'm not saying that he's a good person and I'm not saying that his, his values and his convictions align with me, but he signed that bill. You talking about the civil rights? Which bill did he sign? The civil rights bill? Which one are you talking about? There was a lot of bills during the civil rights era. era. You know, the voting rights bill. Um, oh yeah, the entire civil rights bill, which consisted of you know a bunch of policy. Um, you know, fair compensation act, and uh, the list goes on. <clears throat> that essentially made our situation in here in America um, better. I mean, obviously, it didn't solve everything. We still have a lot of issues. Um, that we need to kind of come through and and get resolved, but it was it was steps in in the right direction. Yeah, I'm not saying that I support Lyndon B. Johnson as a person and that I stand by his values uh, or how his his sentiments towards black people. But during that era, there was actual legislation that was pushed through that may have some benefit on us. And maybe that has a lot to do with the with the fact that at that time we were more together and unified as a community, right? And, you know, obviously within our community, we had different leaders who had different ideologies and ideas about how we can press forward. You have Malcolm X, who was probably on the totally other uh, you know, end of the spectrum compared to Doc, Dr. Martin Luther King. And fascinating enough, as they got older, they were kind of almost coming together, uh, meeting somewhere in the middle. But I think that's absolutely fine. The thing is, they, they had their different ideas and different ways in trying to improve our situation here in, Amer in America empower us, but they were working towards, ultimately towards the same common goal. And um, so the goals were kind of you know, were kind of um, um, similar or familiar throughout the spectrum of black leaders during that time. And I think because of that, we were more, we we're more effective at getting some things done. And- I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of pushback uh, when you say that Lyndon B. Johnson's policies actually help black people because uh, why prior to, and this is maybe a topic for a different subject, because I, I would also like to talk about the particulars of the bill, because I know you read the bill, I haven't read the bill. Uh, but I would say before, you know, the civil rights bill, uh, we were more intact when it came to crime, education, we had more people that were actually in professional um, uh, career fields before the civil rights bill. And I would say a lot of his policies actually caused us to maybe take a downturn or slow those things down i.e we could take something like um affirmative action right people are under the common belief that 
affirmative action move more black people into certain career fields like lawyers and managers and that's not true uh actually we had we were increasing in those career fields at a higher rate before the silver before the uh affirmative action uh bill right was passed so in it is other bills similar to that also we could speak on you can talk about like welfare act whatever else that actually did more to damage the black community than it did to help so uh, maybe he was well intentioned but i doubt it because the rhetoric that at least he's you know, they said he said um you know i haven't actually heard the tape i've seen the writing a hundred times um but i have heard him say some pretty hanky things uh in his in his tapes but he didn't sound like the type of person that was really about that life for black people. And then even hearing what Malcolm X said about Lyndon B. Johnson and the uh, Democratic Party at that time, I, I'm not impressed. So I would, having not been alive, I would venture to say that he probably was pulling the same thing that a person like Hillary Clinton or Bill Clinton uh was pulling in the 90s which is acting as their your friend in order to gain your vote or maintain your vote yeah i mean i guess you can say the same thing about donald trump maybe he's in support or endorsing this bill because he's trying to attract black voters i think what's most important is what we get out of it right if a bill is passed like the one that's on the table right now that means recidivism rates, hopefully. And looking at the, the sections, I think that the ideas behind these uh, different policies will be effective, but it's yet to be seen. But hopefully, you know, recidivism rates will decrease and that will have a benefit for our people. You know, they have rehabilitation programs embedded in this act that will help ease that transition from uh, prison uh, back, you know, being back introduced into our society. So, and, and I can go, you know, go on about some of the other uh, policies that's present within it. So to me, it's really about, I, I guess I was speaking not directly to Lyndon, about Lyndon B. Johnson, but I was speaking on the policy that was passed during this time. Now you make a, a very uh, compelling argument when you bring about, bring up the idea that, you know, maybe deseg or, uh, desegregation was not the best for our community. Uh, because we did have pockets of uh, black communities that were, uh, you know, starting to thrive and we had our own businesses, you know, and things of that nature. And maybe it may have had a negative, potentially a negative impact on that. I, I can see that, that viewpoint or that perspective. But, you know, giving us the right to vote, I think, was extremely important. And I know we had a discussion previously in one of our older videos about voting and its power and and you know whether it's worth it or not, but me personally, I think that us being able, able to vote is impactful because it will help determine or dictate what type of policies and legislation will be passed. If we hold uh, the individuals that we vote for, uh, if we hold their feet to the fire. So. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I hear you. Uh, I think you, know, you got down to the nitty gritty. Um, the litmus is, does the bill actually help? And if it doesn't, uh, then everybody's at fault, right? I think right. That part of the issue is you have people who sit on high and they have good ideas, well-intentioned sometimes, sometimes they're doing it for political reasons. Uh, but we have to also look at, I think uh, for me, I, I would want to look closer at the bill before I comment on it in whole, but um, the effect that you get is never going to be a, a zero sum or it's not It's not going to be like ones or zeros. It's going to be analog, right? And that's going to be uh, affected by the incentives that the bill gives. So you have to think about Who's it going to affect at the end of the day? If, it, if it's going to say, for instance, I, like I haven't read the bill, so those who listen to me right now just call, proceed with caution, right? <laughs> um, if we're saying that what we're trying to get out the bill is just to get more people out of, keep more people out of prison, then what is the incentive for a person 
not to do whatever that was that they were doing that should have put them in prison or would have put them in the prison before. If uh, if it is, you know, maybe holding a small amount of drugs, and maybe that person is an abuser of drugs. And uh, if they don't have an incentive to stop doing the drugs and you don't have a program that's going to rehabilitate a person from said drugs, the bill is going is not going to work completely right um so that's that's what i'm waiting to see i'm waiting to see like how this actually plays out in the real world i mean we can sit here you know people can sit down with their degrees or whatever and they can say well this is the way it should work but when the bill actually hits the street when the rubber hits the road you know how is it going to affect people we have to be we have to have a responsive system that's able to react um, to either change the bill if it's not working or scrap it all together and maybe go back to what the way it was before. Yeah, I yeah. see what you're saying. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to say, I, I think that, and I do want to just quickly circle back to what was being discussed before about the Democrats uh, possibly uh, blocking this bill. And I think they have access to really good uh rhetoric by saying that they don't support it because it doesn't go far enough. And I, I, I say that because I feel like it's, it's, it works as an attack on two different fronts. So first, what it does, it allows them to not vote for it, which would, you know, that's going to reduce a potentially uh, very heavy hitting bragging right for Trump. You know, that, that would, that would essentially mitigate that to, to nothing. Um, and that would give Trump you know, because if they were to go through with that, that would give Trump a talking point as we enter into the 2020 campaign season uh, that could potentially sway that vote in his, well, not potentially, it would sway that vote in his favor. And then secondly is that it allows uh, the Democrats to continue their narrative as, and I like that term that, that uh, Antoine coined, the gatekeepers of the Negroes. It would allow them to, to keep that, um, that identity, essentially, by stating that the bill somehow wouldn't help Black people as much as the bill should be designed to help Black people. And I think they would take that and, and run with it. And then as, as far as, I know you, were, you, know, you guys were mentioning how um, Trump has been portrayed you know, and presented by the media. And a lot of that stuff is not, you know, like I wouldn't go as far as to say that he's not a racist, um, you know, based off of some of his actions that he has, you know, there's documented proof like uh, 1973, where you've got the documented evidence of, of his racism uh, through his uh, Trump management corporation where they, directly violated the Fair Housing Act, you know, and, and when they were lying to um, black applicants about the availability of, of units and uh, they would refuse to rent to black tenants, you know, and, and then there was the 1980s with the casino accusations where uh, the black staff members were requested to exit the area when Trump and his, you know, his then wife would enter the space. You know, then the Central Park Five, when Trump was insisting that these people were, were guilty, even when uh, D DNA evidence proved otherwise. You know, he's he's got all these different things that he's been doing over the years where it's, you know, it's like a, you know, it's, it's like a, a degree of longevity at that point. So I wouldn't uh, completely dismiss him or really anyone else for being a racist because they do, you know, one one act. I think it is a, a good first step, as the name implies, but I, I feel like, you know, it's going to take more and more actions to, to speak much louder than the words that he's been presenting for decades. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. You got to look, look at the full body of work. You did lay out some things um, within his history that kind of points to him maybe being a racist or at least practicing bigotry. So yeah, I agree with that. One thing you had talked about with the Democrats, I think, so at least from all that I've read, all most Democrats are actually in support of this bill. There were a few Democrats who came out, surprisingly, Cory Booker, who's an African-American African male, you would think that he would be in support of some of this. And I understand, you know, his point of saying that it didn't go, 
it doesn't go too far. And I also can see your perspective that he's maybe he's saying that, but really his motive is to try and prevent Trump from getting any type of support from black people or prevent Trump from potentially getting reelected. Exactly. That, yeah, that definitely is possible. But um, overall, most Democrats are actually in support of this bill. Um, so that's that's a good thing. It was something yeah, twice. Let me ask you, bro. I'll go ahead, Dad. Go, go ahead, Tom. I was gonna, let me ask you both. Uh, if a person is racist, uh, yet, and I think I already know both of you guys' answer, which is good. I think we're all <laughs> kind of straight. we're thinking in the same light. Regardless, if a person of a person's personal feelings even how they like to conduct their personal life. Um, if at the end of the day, the policies they push forward are good for you. And at the end of the day, because you know we like to put people in these boxes and say, this person is a racist and this person is not a racist. This is this black guy in the South um, who visits uh, KKK members. And he asked them, you know, how come you don't like dealing with black people, whatever else? He has a conversation with them. And by the end of that conversation, uh, these KKK members are consistently turning in their hoods. At the end of the day, if a person is racist or not, it's really immaterial because in some degree, we're all racist. Because there's times where you, you've been racist in your life at one point or another, or you've had racist thoughts. And you may have even had power to make somebody else feel a certain way or, but at the end of the day, if a person's heart is good and they're working toward, uh, you know, a common good for you, does it matter? And is it fair to frame this person? Is it fair to frame them as a racist? Yeah. So first of all, I think we need to make a clear distinction between discrimination or having prejudices and racism. Uh, obviously racism, when you look at the etymology of the word, it has mutated over time to represent or be defined as this like, this all tale general term, like someone who practiced discriminatory acts can be considered a racist. Um, someone who makes a insinuary comment, you know, may be considered a racist. In my mind, racism is when you oppress a, a specific group of people on the basis of their race, their color or their ethnicity. And the examples that Jeremy laid out are examples of the practice of racism. In 73, like the, like you said, the maltreatment of uh, blacks, try, uh, pr trying to prevent them from, excuse me, um, you know, renting out his property and things of that nature. Like these are clear examples of the president having, um, and trying to oppress or suppress a group of people. So I, I think it's just important that we make that, that distinction. Yeah, I think that right now, currently, there's only two places um, essentially on earth where black people can, can participate in racism. And, and those two places are uh, Liberia and Ethiopia. Outside of those two places, there's nowhere on this planet where, where a, a black person Unfortunately, you know, and fortunately, because that's not a good system where you're um, basically controlling an entire subset of the population based on something is what could and should be as trivial as race. You know, I, I feel like, um, but that now we can be prejudiced. You know, we we can have, you know, uh, you know, not like somebody because you know, uh, they're short hair. We could not like somebody because they have freckles or bristles. We can't do anything with that dislike to systematically stop or refrain them from being able to go and get jobs or be able to get a get a home to be able to do all these things that people feel like they should be able to do within a functional society. We just, we don't have that degree of, of power and influence and control over the society to be able to um, implement any uh, participation in racism, especially within the United States. 
Okay, yeah. so let me let me uh, just say this because you guys gave a very interesting uh, definition of racism and prejudice. So straight from the from the army's definition of what racism is versus prejudice, or I think we just look it up on Google. Prejudice just simply means to prejudge somebody. So if you prejudge somebody for any reason, that is prejudice. If you're prejudging somebody on the basis of their race, that is racism. It is it's really nothing it has nothing to do with po- with uh, power. So if we want to but if we want to talk about power, and I don't know what you call that, if you want to call that power politics, power racism, whatever else, you're you're castrating yourself if you're saying you don't have the power to 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 uh we ca- we captured ourselves when we said we don't have the power to inflict uh, or the the strength to inflict pain or keep somebody from getting something. I e. if you have a business and you decide not to hire a white person because off the basis of their color, because I'm not hiring any white people. I'm only hiring black people. That is racism. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm not saying that you don't have the right to do it because. Yeah, uh, I need to anywhere, anywhere, so, anywhere in the world, you can go anywhere in the world as a human being. You have that power. You have that sovereignty to, to leave the United States, go to Africa, build a home, build a business, hire other Africans. To You have the opportunity to take products in Africa and sell them in the Caribbean or in the U.S. to other African-Americans. You have the opportunity also to open up a business in the in the United States and do things here. Yeah, but we have power. So where is this? The fact that he has businesses and one, these are all alleged. He settled out of court, so everything is alleged. I, I'll stop. I'll let you. I'll let you. Yeah, 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 Jack, so there was something that you said. So you were talking about uh, black business saying, "Hey, I'm going to only hire black people." Uh, typically, and I know that was just a hypothetical. But if you're a disenfranchised group within a power structure that you have no participation in as far as, um, like, within a power structure and you don't play a pivotal role within that structure, within that power structure, I don't think that it's racist if you're trying to give participants or members of your community more opportunity because of the consequences that go along with being under this power structure that may be suppressing you. So I, I you know, I, I don't think it's as black and white. It's, it's, it's a little, it's, there's more to it. I'm thinking more like Malcolm X, because Malcolm X said, Malcolm X said, how can we not create uh, own jobs? And how can we not create our own jobs? Uh, I'm well, let, me my let me finish my thought. So I think what Jeremy was kind of articulating is, if you don't have any control, if you don't have any power, if you don't have, um, you know, a significant amount of control of the you know, the flow of money and things through a, a socio, you know, within a specific country or place, it it is almost it's it's almost impossible for you to be racist towards a group of people because mm-hmm. the, the the people hold on let me finish the people who are in power who are in control. They will be able to make sure that the that the members of their particular race or ethnicity has the opportunities that they need to thrive and to become successful in things of that nature. So racism, even, if though, but racism. Goes, but even if a white person goes to a black business, and let's say all black businesses decided, hey, we're no longer gonna hire anyone who's outside of our race, or we're no longer gonna hire any white people, right? White people will fare very well. <laughs> they'll still be able to go to the majority white businesses, get the products that they need. They'll be able to get the jobs that they need, so on and so forth. If white people said, hey, I'm not gonna, we're not going to hire any black people. We're not going to sell to any black people in the United States. That would, that would subsequently devastate our community. Okay. Let, let so me that's kind of, uh, that's, that kind of allows for you to... Yeah, yeah let, me, let me respond. That's that's a mouthful, but I will say this. We have two hands. We, to, we have two feet. We have brains. We have spirits. We have ambitions. So I, I'm thinking like Sway when he was talking to Kanye. I'm thinking like Malcolm X. 
it doesn't make a difference if they're going to hire you or not hire you. But I mean, in this country they have, and maybe that actually hurt us in a lot of ways, but I'll just keep saying it, man. I feel like we can go anywhere in the world. Home base is Africa. Home base is our community here in America, right? And we can we can do it. Like what what can we not do? What can we not build? Well, I, I put it like this. I believe that you're 100 percent correct in that we do have the power to be mobile. We can uh, mobilize ourselves. We can build. We can we can do all of these things. That is true. But I'm when I when I talk about like racism and being racist, like I'm I'm taking it back to the very root. Like a lot of the English language derived from Latin like Latin and Spanish, like these all are the things that essentially were used to create the English language. And ism is, a, is, is Latin and so is ist. And both of these things are referring to a system or a doctrine where things are mandated. And, you know, as we know, a, a doctrine is like a, you know, it's like basically a, a principle of, of government policy. Um, and so, so when you're looking at something of, of that scale, that magnitude, that's not something that we're uh, currently in a position to where we directly control that. So as long as we're not controlling that, with the exception of the two places that I mentioned, um, we're not in a position to where we can push any sort of system of, of racism. Like we're just, we're not able to, now that I'm, doesn't I'm, say that I'm we're just completely lost, powerless. I would say that Liberia is not as far as long or has as much sovereignty as power as Ghana. So Liberia is not one of those countries I would say that they can't be racist or, you know, or they can be racist up under your definition. Um, I mean, we have to really look and we have to start, start thinking, I mean, the doctrine that we have when it comes to race hurts us more than it helps us, right? We are not where we were 150 years or 200 years ago uh, when our ancestors were enslaved. We've come from that, and they wouldn't want us thinking in the same way or thinking up under that same system. The white persons are the minority in the world. I mean, we just have to look at the demographics, say we're the majority, and any, at any time we can wake up. You are in a dream state, and as soon as you wake up, not I'm not saying you guys, I'm just saying that we are in a dream state. As soon as we wake up and we decide that, hey, we're just going to be on our square, be about our business, and go to work, uh, things will change, not overnight, immediately. You won't have to wait till the morning. So I totally agree with that, but I think you're dealing with ideals that I really agree with, and what we're talking about is kind of the reality of this term or this concept of racism. And like, like I stated, when you look in, and uh, Jeremy laid out the etymology of it, when you look at the origin of racism and what it meant, and again, it's transformed and mutated throughout you know, its history. And right now we're at a point where it means it's almost like this umbrella term, right? But when you look at the root of it and what it truly means, that's what, that's what we're kind of dealing with, right? And we're trying, I guess I'm trying to make make a clear distinction between prejudices and, discrimi and you know, discriminative uh, ideas versus you know, racism. It's more, it's more systematic. But I agree with you 100%. Like, yes, we need to recognize that it's important for us to, build to be empowered. It's important for us to build our own economy, to build for ourselves, to you know, roll our sleeves up and get dirty and make things happen. I agree with that 100%, but we were kind of talking about this term racism and maybe all that, that parallel between President Trump and maybe some of the things that he's allegedly done in the past and how you can look at that, that those things and then fit him into this racism based maybe. on what the, the term truly means, not this watered down term that we deal with uh, nowadays. Yeah, I think, but I think the term that we're dealing with nowadays is actually watered down. The, the one that you guys are talking about, about this power stuff is, is, is really what's watered down and hurting us because I'll say this, nothing is stopping you. You know, it's like, that's, we have to just completely embody that mantra that nothing is really stopping us. Like when we decide to go, it's time to go, we go. I think, um, I was thinking about this earlier. I think like one of the most immediate ways for us to really 
uh, uh, make a change. Like normally, if somebody wants something done, what do they want to do? They want to use their money to make that thing happen. Most people will say, OK, uh, there needs to be a bridge built to get across the water. And most people don't want to go out and actually build a bridge. They want to find money to have the bridge built. Right. That's the system. So the, the biggest the biggest impediment is the money or the purchasing power, right? It's not the political power. It's let's get the money uh, because you can have anybody build anything for you if you have the money. If you have, and it's not um, we're talking about, and money actually comes from labor. Money comes from work. You can't get a, you can't get away from that. Some people make money uh, in the finance system. Some. They can do that, but that's still work. Don't think they're not going in there and they're not swindling people out of doing what they have to do to do that. So the more inroads we get to getting our people money, then the more influence we have. If right. Not a white man for money. If you're depending on white people to give you money, that's a problem. I, I completely agree with with that sentiment, and and here here's here's something that that I uh, do think about a lot because I, I believe money is definitely I would say that that would solve the lion's share of of the issues, but only if it's money with with a purpose. And by that I mean, you know, a couple things like for example, uh, utilities. You know, um, you know, power companies, things like that. We need things of, of that magnitude. And, you know, like one of our biggest markets happens to be sports and entertainment. So you figure you've got what, like 1700 players total in the NFL and we've got countless millions of people playing football and focusing only on football as they go through their entire scholastic careers only to, to have a very small ratio of people that actually get accepted into the NFL uh, become members of, of that franchise. So rather than doing that, what if, because these football players, they're making a, you know, they're making a lot of money and this is just like one entity. So what if another platform was able to be built and people would look at that platform as being as "Quote unquote important as being in the NFL, you yeah. know. But that's if money is directed in a in a better way. Because now, if everybody's focusing all their efforts on going into the NFL, they have to. In most cases, because there's some people that could go right out of high school, but in in most cases, they're going to have to go to some university or some school to get to the NFL. And who owns the schools? So now you're giving. So on the way up to the NFL, that you may not even you you likely won't get into you're putting so many dollars into all of these different institutions that are so when you talk about like people building stuff you're looking at the school systems you're looking at like there's a lot of things that have been created by labor and it's like if you just sit back and think of all the things that you would be able to build if you had a team of people that were working cohesively with hundreds and hundreds of years of free labor like what can you do so we it's not that i'm trying to come from a point of castration but rather it's acknowledging the fact that we're there's an entirely different group that has had one heck of a head start on us and to the point to where they have been able to establish the school systems and the you know all these different institutions the power companies the cable companies where they can continuously feed us this garbage as we come home from a long day's work and we sit in front of this box and then they just teach us more stuff they give us the uh, the hip hop wise, whatever that's the love and hip hop, whatever that show is called. They give us that. They give us these commercials that continue. So it's like we're you know starting what? from a very low position when we've got a long way to go if we want to see some changes. You know what? We watch this before we talk a and, lot and, about that, yeah. So it's causing me to pose this question, right? Uh, yeah, because I agree. Uh, but the question is this. Do we need to work within this socio-political structure or capitalistic structure that we're currently under, 
or do we need to just exist within it, but then create create our own? I personally believe that the latter would be best. I think we could exist here in the United States, but still create our own economy, create our own kind of like social system. It, it would be difficult because there is the potential that that would be could be considered a threat to the the system that we that we're currently under. But I, I definitely think it's possible. And I think in order to accomplish some of the things that you're referring to, Jeremy, that's what we need to do. We need to. In fact, I think that's what you're saying in, in totality. Well, I'm we saying that, but I'm also saying look at every single state in the United States of America and how there's a Chinatown in basically every single one of them where they grow these small communities and these communities start to expand. And you look at like the Chinatown that exists in San Francisco, for example. So it's something that's definitely doable within this um, capitalist society that we currently live in, but it's just, we have to be able to come together and put those steps and, and begin that labor in order to produce these results because it's being done. We're seeing it everywhere. Yeah, yeah, what says something was powerful. He said the only luxury is time. And I think that's what people think that money is the they think money is the key. Money is like the outcome of your labor. Labor is you exchange your labor and your time for money, right? So it's all about us being able to one, we have to get out of this idea that we constantly have to spend and buy everything at some point we need to start stacking our chips putting those to the side because the benefit that we do have being in the u.s is the u.s dollar is still the strongest currency going period no matter what they tell you about the u.s economy you are benefited by this dollar anywhere in the world that you go damn near anywhere you want in, in the world unless you're like somewhere in the middle east or a few european countries that dollar is going to carry a lot of weight. It's going to go really far. I think it would benefit us to take advantage of that exchange rate and of the strength that the dollar has. Not saying that we just completely cut ties with America. You have to exist within the system, work with the system. You have to see what those benefits are. But you also have to start, we have to start building our own. Now, it's all, I say we have to start. This is already being done in bits and pieces by black people all over the world. Um, I was looking at, and I'm going to have another a podcast or a vlog tomorrow on style. I want to go back to style again. When you start, I was looking at the movie A Demolition Man, and I looked at, you know, their depiction of the future at that time and the clothing that people were wearing, and it just struck me that all these clothing was, it was very African in style. And there's going to be this meld, I believe, of African style with the European style. People are starting to wear their hair the way that they want to wear their hair. They're starting to wear their clothes the way that they want to wear their clothes. That African cultural clothing. I think that's going to meet somewhere in the middle with the European clothing. It's going to be the style of the future. And I'm saying if it's going to be if that style is going to be pushed, I would hate to see that being pushed by Chinese manufacturers building African clothes, which is happening right now. And these should be African clothiers that are building these clothes. And I think that black people all over the world, you have 250 million black people in the Western hemisphere should be wearing those clothes. Those clothes should be made in Ghana. Those clothes should be made in Kenya, in Ethiopia. I, I do want to make this statement though, because you, you kind of talked about how we don't, how like, I, I don't know if you were saying we don't need money or money is not what's most important, but like when we live, we live in this capitalistic society. And if we're going to exist within this society, we have to understand how capitalism works. And honestly, in order for us to start anything on our own, we need capital, right? So we have to come up with these, to produce that capital, and then via a unified front, take that capital and invest in things uh, to to create these manufacturing jobs and to create the economy, the black economy that we're looking for. So capital does capital does have an importance, like money has an importance. I mean, we live in a globalistic economy now, a global economy now, so, and this world is becoming more and more capitalistic. In fact, it is. I, since uh, the, uh, you know, the, the days of colonialism, that, that's what's been going on. Colonialism is rooted in capitalism. 
So us as a community, we have to learn how to play the game of capitalism. Once we can understand that, and we, we are at a disadvantage because we're starting the race late, right? We're, we're joining this game, I mean, this system of capitalism late. So it's so important that we gain an understanding of how this system works. Once we do that, we can take our money and um, be most effective with its use. It's a, it's a military term it's called war SWAT. And there's one more. Yeah, one. Yes, if you look at the people, you can say, okay, yeah, well, our, 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 our weakness is, you know, you know we, we have a, a little problem. But what are our strengths? The strength is, is the majority of the world. Opportunities. 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 And at the same time, you have to know where those risks are so you don't, you know, Potentially, potentially fall in a, in a hole, hole and get and caught up in the echo. You are. Let me yeah, see. I'm hearing that. that. I'm hearing that as well. Muted, but yeah, one thing that Antoine touched on that I, I do um, like is when he, he said that money is the outcome of our labor, and I, I truly agree with that. But I don't feel like that's necessarily the stopping point. I feel like while it is the outcome of our labor. I don't want to leave it as just output. I want to also have it as input. So after we get that out of labor, labor, we could also, we could also use, use money as a conduit to, to be used as that economy. economy. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree. Um, I agree. Yeah, I definitely agree. But in order to create those opportunities of labor, you got to have money. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? It still goes back to goes back to money, and I think we just have to accept that fact and um, realize that. And I think through realizing that and pooling our monies, you have brought up the idea of like starting an organization in which all these, you know, the seventeen hundred uh, NFL players who have obviously a ton of money, you know, start an organization, put their money into that. Other people can invest, and then we can figure out, strategize how to use that money to our advantage to generate the the jobs and everything that we need to, to create this black economy. But well, it is one, it is one. One. Say it again. we were talking about, yeah, you were talking about the NFL players. And I think at some point earlier this year, I'm like, how come Africa does not have an NBA? How huge would that be if Africa had, you had all these African players coming over here and, and participating in the NBA in the United States, but we have the best, Athletes, Milwaukee. This guy is a freak of freaking nature, man. Or you look at you look at like NBA, like Africa should have its own NBA. And it turns out they just started their own NBA. You have like eight teams. I think last year was their first season. So I, that's a good news story, but I would like to see. Um, I was watching this uh, documentary yesterday. It was on the left. Have you seen these guys before? Again, freaks of freaking nature, man. These guys are all like big. And they're like really good fighters. And uh, the the stadiums, however, like they had a stadium collapse just last year. Last year. Like, um, people were rumbling in the in the stands, and the stadium collapsed and killed eight people. And I was thinking, I was thinking, if somebody, if a, if somebody, if somebody, if somebody if Jordan, who was pro who's probably the the last person to do this, <laughs> but if you were to go there, go there and build, and build a, a decent stadium for them. To have these wrestling matches in, I mean, that's just as big as sumo in Japan. And do you know how profitable sumo in Japan is? It's super profitable. I mean, there's so many opportunities for us to one connect with the continent and the Caribbean and South America, the people that look like us, uh, but also to make money. Because you have to, we have to find out what we have in common. What do people like about? us as a group of people that would sell you, you ever heard oh if it sells in peoria or or if it flies in peoria, in peoria in the rest of the country. we have to figure out what those things are that actually work in peoria per per se 
Uh, and then we have to push those things out and support those things. Uh, and I think there's just it's so much opportunity still left. Because they're racist. Yeah, racist. I just don't know. I'm not I just don't look at that as a really something that can hold us back because we can move outside of that power structure into other areas and then move back into the power structure to lift up some of the people that are that are here and then move back out again. And that's that's the freedom and sovereignty that we have as humans. You know, we can go do, we just have to believe in ourselves. Here's my question though. Do you think that we should focus more of our attention on creating here in the United States, here in our home? I, I, I think that's a great idea to take advantage of the investment opportunities in Africa, different countries in Africa and uh, different, um, you know, black countries. But personally, I think we should work on you know, building our economy here in the United States. And I think once that we start creating different um, businesses, cable companies, news stations, building our own hospitals, you know, the list goes on, that will give us more leverage and more buying or spending power to um, to, to, to invest in, in other countries, other black countries across the world. We don't um, become the new oppressors. Like that's that's a fear that I've um, discussed with a few other people on that subject. It's like because we've been in a situation to where we're constantly um, dealing with oppression, and I just I really hope that when we go out there, we go out there with the best of intentions at heart, and we don't go out there and try to become the new oppressors of Africans. Because I think both groups here and in on the continent, I think we've both had pretty rough goes at it. So I just, I don't want that to translate into something with any sort of like malintent. And I just, I, I really hope that we could go there with the proper mindset to, to build and help each other out. That's, you just I think that would be our best thing that we could do. Yeah, yeah, uh, you just said it. And also, but Dave, to answer your question, whichever one is more expedient for you, as an individual, if, if you want to stay in the U.S., I say stay in the U.S. If you if it's on your heart, go to uh, Africa and try some local over there. I say try it as long as we don't step on each other. And when I say each other, I'm talking about African-Americans first, because at the end of the day, we'll go over to Africa and Africans identify with Africans for the most part. I'm not saying that doesn't mean we don't work with Africans and, and build relationships, but I think we need to go over there with the proper mindset also to realize that we're not just gonna go over there and everybody's gonna love you because you're African American. Like they they have their way of life and their way of doing things and some people will welcome you back with open arms, but it's gonna be a very large contingent of people and maybe they'll be the less educated ones that don't really wanna deal with you because they're xenophobic. So we have to be our first support system. Like black people, black Americans have to have a support system. The same way if I'm a Ghanaian and I come here, I I I party with other Ghanaians, you know, I go to Ghanaian functions, whatever else. Not that I don't want to deal with African Americans, uh, but there is a, a Ghanaian community, a Nigerian community here. And then if we go there, it's if we go to Ghana, there's a small African American community already in place that works with the Ghanaians also. Um Dave, uh, Dave and um, I'm sorry, uh, 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 Jeremy, I have to call you by your government name. Uh, there's that risk of us going over there and being like the black Jews, right, of Africa or something like that. But it's good and bad. Like when you have a group of people that come in and they are actually taking over the economy in a way, but they're producing, that's not a bad thing. As long as that government, let's say, I'll just use Ghana, even though Ghana is not Politically, I don't think they're going to try to like stamp out African Americans. If African Americans do really well in Ghana, then let's say, not saying politically, you're not going to go into any African country and have any political power as an African American. They will run the country. But if you, let's say, we just do really good in one particular field, we went over there and let's say we started an NBA or something like that, and it did really well, and we became rich from that then 
we would build up the African American community in a, in Africa, and we would also build the African American community in America, right? And people may look at that and not like. It. So you would have to work. It, it's politically a part. If you're in a country where you don't have political power, then you have to work the same way that the Jews do here by giving a lot to those communities in Africa to promote their causes. And that's what, like, I think the, the, the position that the Jews are in America, in America is they have to at least appear to support black causes. At least it appear to, you know, uh, support gay, lesbian, whatever else, and kind of promote those things. Uh, to kind of keep and, and, and group themselves in with those groups so they don't they don't again become oppressed. I don't know if I'm but yeah that that's very <laughs> like, uh, uh, a group of people that's doing very well to be looked at as a pariah on, on the larger community. Yeah no I completely understand what you're saying. I do have a question. When you say oh we could you know we could potentially go to these different countries in Africa, kind of invest in Africa and uh you know engender you know money and things of that nature are you also saying that we then do, through repatri we should re repatriate that money back to america to help our economy here to help black americans out are you do you agree with that or black americans specifically because i wouldn't want to uh, uh, you know there's no need there's to help no need. america yeah. doing very very well, very well. But this is a way for us to build schools or uh, banks for that would directly um, benefit Black Americans? Yes, like I would go to Africa with this intention to yes, uh, work with people, Black people all over the world, but you belong to a tribe, whether you like it or not, right? People will always identify you as the African American. They're not gonna say, well, this guy has been here for five years, now he's African. No, they're gonna say he's been here five years, We. He's a nice person, but he's an African American, so he's not me exactly. So who am I? I am Antoine the African American. I would look for other African Americans to partner with in Africa. I would look to partner with African Americans back in America. And I would still work with my African brothers and sisters, not trying to tell them how they should run their country, but just getting over there and getting down to business, trying to make some money, trying to I think that I think that, that, that but I also think that it has a bit of a time limit on it as well until we are ultimately accepted. And I believe the reason for that ties back into what you were saying when you were talking about uh, doing the labor to build bridges. I don't feel like in a for this in a physical sense, I think more of like in a like a metaphorical sense, um, building bridges because you got to consider like for. Africa has been largely colonized with the exception of two countries. Um, all of their countries have been colonized by foreigners and these foreigners have been building these bridges essentially about us on our behalf, you know, whether we wanted them to or not, just because they had that proximity and they had that influence um, over the different media platforms and to be able to spread and produce and spread that narrative about us. So I feel like as more and more of us go over there and see that, you know, a lot of the things that we do, yeah, we may have some differences, but there's a lot of things that are going to be alike as well. Because if you go back a couple hundred years, you know, we're sharing the same bloodlines with these people. So if, if as we begin to breed and create offspring and those offspring create. So we may not see it in our lifetimes, but our grandchildren, if we do things correctly, they will all be accepted. We'll all be essentially the same because we've got experiences here that we can bring to uh, their continent. Uh, we've got other people all over like the, you know, in South America, we've got people all across the diaspora. And if we all you know, begin that migration and we start working together and building together and creating families together and bringing everything back to back to our roots. Um, 
I feel like we're, we're going to start to see more and more similarities than, than differences. And I, I feel like that's how we're ultimately going to be able to do it. Otherwise, we're always going to have that divide because we're always going to have that narrative portrayed for us. And, and, I, cool. and, and, I, and I do think that us building that relationship and realizing those similarities uh, with uh, African people is really important because that will also help to protect us from being like, you know, some of these uh, neo-colonialists where we just go, we're going over there and, you know, we're investing in them, but our primary goal is to engender or generate uh, money that we can take back to America and it can benefit our community. I think there has to be a um, more of a mutual economic relationship or a mutual beneficial relationship amongst uh, the two people. And, um, and yeah, hopefully at some point we can, we can kind of like become one <laughs> where you know, African Americans are one with, with Africans and we have the support of one another, not only from an economic standpoint, but even from a military standpoint, um, as far as protection, like if blacks are being maltreated here in America, that our, our African brothers and sisters will come to, to our support and come to our aid and demand that the American government cease any maltreatment. So we don't have that right now. I, I think that I know that's that's a grand a grandiose idea, but I, you know, I think that's no, also true. Like what you guys are saying is exactly right. If you you have an African friend, I'm sure all of us have an African friend whose parents immigrated here. When we look at that African friend, we say, okay, he's African American. But initially, and then also, like, where does our allegiance lie? Initially. My allegiance, I'm not going to go over to Africa and all of all of a sudden I'm African, right? My allegiance still allies with African Americans. Yes, in the future. Maybe it takes a generation, maybe it takes two generations, and we start to intermingle and mix. And yeah, that all that stuff will work. When you said something else, though, you talked about the military. And if you want to talk about a head start, yeah, there's nobody there's no catching up to the US military, right? If we're talking about putting a space force, whatever. The Africans build, they are at a disadvantage because it's already been built. We're, we're working on space now. Now we're trying to we're trying to dominate space. So it's not and that's not just a head leaps and a, a head, a heads and a leaps and above um, Africa, but just anywhere like the U.S. is so far ahead militarily than any other country that it's it, with the exception of maybe like Russia, even Russia. Uh, just so far ahead, that no, that's where we're at disadvantage. So that's kind of sad. Yeah, it really, when it comes to maybe conventional forces, uh, we there's opportunities there. And I don't want to talk about that now, being an American, because we're not supposed to build militias. I'm not talking about building militias. I'm talking about building the capacity of African armies to deal with African problems. But I don't think Africa should try to have war or ever even think about war with the U.S. Well, and, and, I'm not, and I'm not and I'm not saying having war. And honestly, I think we're in this we're in a peacetime right now because we recognize the potential consequences or implications of another war, world war, you know, breaking out. So I think we'll just continue to have little spats throughout the world. Um, Lord, help us if if another war, you know world war breaks out. But um, but I think that we could potentially um, add a lot or give a lot to the African people when it comes to the, their military structure. Like all of the information, all of the, uh, the professionals, military professionals that we have here in America, we could potentially help them out. And also, I, I don't think that they should develop a defeated attitude and, and, and say, you know, well, America has a huge head start. In fact, the uh, Eurocentric people in general have a huge uh, head start when it comes to, to the military. I think that they should actively work towards building their their military and catching up. Now, will they ever catch up? I don't know. But but yeah, like you say, I love America. <laughs> I am a, a black American. This is my country. This is what I know. I, I am a true patriot. And I believe that America is a multi Well, the idea of America is that we're a multiculturalistic a society that's accepted of, of people from all walks of life. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to get that out. But 
<laughs> militia. Or <some> secrets. <laughs> Get this shit real quick. It was echoing before. <laughs> All right, man. We'll end on that then. <laughs> no, nah, but that was a good discussion. I know we kind of deviated from, you know, talking about this bill, but I still think we cultivated a good conversation. Um, I hope our viewers enjoyed. Please feel free to comment. Um, please subscribe to, to my channel. Tell it like it is. Subscribe to my, my cousin's channel, Logical Conclusion, Antoine Lewis. We'll continue to try to put, you know, good information out there, good discussion, build on, uh, a build together. And, uh, you know, you all have a good night. All right. I had a great time. Thank you. That was big fun. Man. Nice, nice. I'm going to go ahead and stop the... Uh